so easy. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. Come here. How are you doing? Amazing. Amazing. I got a question. What is this thing up here? What? It's a nativity. It's a nativity scene. It helps us tell the story or remember the story of Jesus' birth, right? It has lots and lots of pieces. Who has one of these at home? A few people, yeah. You allowed to play with it and touch it? A little, a couple people. A couple people are, a couple people not so much, yeah. Kind of special pieces, right? Right? What's the most special piece up here? What do you think? Baby Jesus. Anyone, anyone, everyone agree? Is baby Jesus the most important? Wow, look at that. Pretty, pretty much everyone. Are you sure? I mean, I mean, this camel's the biggest piece. Aren't big pieces supposed to be the most important? No. No, big pieces aren't the most important? Well, then little pieces must be important. The sheep is little. He must be the most important. No. No? No? Well, I just, I, the angel. Angels are pretty, and angels, he... Angels way up high. The angel knew before anyone else and announced it to everyone. Why isn't the angel most important? Because Jesus is God's son. That's right. Doesn't get much more important than that, does it? No. Even though we all fight over who gets to be Mary and Joseph in the pageant... Jesus is always still the most important part of the nativity set, right? Very most important because we have to remember not only is Jesus God's son, but in our belief, Jesus is part of God. And God is part of Jesus. Jesus coming meant God came into our world. And so that's why the kings brought gifts and the shepherds brought sheep and angels stood watch because Jesus, a little itty bitty baby, was the most important. And as Jesus grew, what did Jesus do? Which was more important even than just being in the nativity. Jesus went to the cross, right? That's the most important of all. So, it's good that we have nativity sets. And it's good that you already know what the most important piece of the nativity set is. It's Jesus. It's the thing that we need to remember all through this season is it's all about who? Jesus. There we go. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for all the different ways that we are able to tell your story. We tell your story so others might hear it, so that we might remember it. Keep all these things in our heart as treasures where we keep Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, but they will not. They will flock to him, seek him out in the countryside and in the meeting places. They will clamor for his healing, his miracles. They will hear the words of his voice, but they will not listen. They will not heed his voice. They will not follow his example. They will not complete his teaching, and love will be lost.
even those closest to him, his twelve chosen, even they failed to follow. Instead, they quarrel and bicker amongst themselves over small matters. They seek out favor and greatness where there is none to be had. I am that I am. I am as I have ever been, and as I will ever continue to be. I seek that which I have always sought, that they might know my love, and that they might love in return. What shall I do? There is but one thing to do. It will require what it has always required. Take this cup from my hand. Sacrifice. But not my will be done. Pain. Thy will be done. Suffering. Forgive them, Father. Blood. For they know not what they do. Death. It is finished. Not theirs, but mine. Maybe at that high price, they will understand their sin. Seek out forgiveness. Seek out love. Maybe then they will understand. The price is great, but it, it's, it is worth it. Because I love them that much. Let there be life. That is good. That is good. Salvation. There's a story of a man who was coming through the line following church, greeted the preacher and said, well, that was a good message. But I tell you, every time I come to church, all you seem to be doing is preaching about the birth and the resurrection. Don't you think you need to be preaching on more than that? Well, John, I suppose I do, said the preacher. I spend a good deal of time on the birth and the resurrection, but I tell you, if he came to church more often than Christmas and Easter, <laughs> you might hear a little bit more about it. Even as everyday Sunday Christians, we need to hear the message of that dialogue and what this series has meant to convey we mark Christmas as an important day on the calendar. It's the highlight of the secular year. It's the highlight of the business year, the sales year. It makes or breaks companies. And often we make it the highlight of the Christian year as well. It's where we spend the most time in decorating and putting on pageantry and cantatas and children's pageants, advent candles, wreaths, cards. We go to great expense. We just got our Christmas cards finished the other day. But who amongst us sends Easter cards? We make lavish, expensive gifts and buy things and give them to, as presents to family and friends and co-workers and business associates. But who amongst us gives Easter presents besides candied eggs and chocolate bunnies? Don't get me wrong, I'm all about celebrating Easter. It's an important day. It's the day that God broke down all the barriers that separate us from the holy and 
entered into our world through Jesus Christ. But the story cannot and does not end at the manger. It continues. It's interconnected, and it leads us from the manger all the way to the cross. From the cross to the empty tomb. The whole of the Old Testament is about getting us prepared for Easter. You cannot understand Christmas without the Exodus story. You cannot understand communion without the Passover story. These things are interrelated and intertwined. And it shows most clearly in our Old Testament reading today. Micah was a prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah during the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to Assyria. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were all kings in Jerusalem during Micah's time as a prophet. Jotham and Ahaz were okay kings. Nothing special about them. They weren't bad. They weren't good. They were adequate. But Hezekiah, Hezekiah, now Hezekiah was a man after David's own heart. Hezekiah turned the people back to God. Hezekiah, as a nation, faced a kingdom under siege. And Hezekiah, rather than turning his attention to foreign alliances, put his protection into following God, God's precepts, God's laws. As Jerusalem lay under siege, it was Hezekiah who found the cistern beneath the city, allowed for the residents to drink water in a city on a hill. Today you can still walk through Hezekiah's well, the fresh water supplied. Yet the handwriting was certainly on the wall. Empires greater than those which had been seen before continued to rise up, and soon the Babylonians would rise up over the Assyrians and strike Judah down. They would be followed by the Persians and the Greeks and finally the Romans. And Judah would never again have its own king. Yet Micah lifted up this prophecy, a king to rule over Israel, a king more powerful from the Davidic monarchs that had come before to restore their rightful place amongst the kingdoms. That's exactly what the crowds were cheering for on that Palm Sunday long, long ago. Branches wave, cloaks out in the roadway, calling for a king to enter into Jerusalem as Jesus came through the city gates. Cheering for a king on Sunday. Calling for his crucifixion on Friday. Let's face it, it is our 2,000 plus years of theological hindsight that separates us from being in that crowd At least sometimes. How many of us can honestly say, honestly convince ourselves that we too would not have been part of those same crowds? Because when it comes right down to it, 
we still look skyward for a king to come down and bring a specific Christian rule over our world. And messiahs aren't supposed to die. God doesn't die. But Jesus said, the good shepherd always lays down his life for his sheep. John 10, 11. We have spent these past few sermons walking through the relationship between God and God's creation. God has asked in each of our little skits, what shall I do? Through each of these sermons, we have seeing that answer play out as God continues to reach out in that relationship for us, even when we struggle to stay within ourselves. With each continuing step, God is committed more and more and more into reaching through the separation and the divide. God with us. But then I've also said over and over again, God doesn't change. Those things have always been what God has been about. God has not continued to reach out further and further for us. We've only become more and more aware of how God reaches for us. All around us, the world is bearing down on us as individuals and collectively. Many people have suggested that these times of political turmoil, these times of upheaval, social and cultural, it is ripe for God's rule to jump back in. But as we call for that, Personally, I think we mean it to be a wake-up call for everyone else but ourselves. Following Christ comes at a price. It might hurt or crunch our lifestyle to really follow it that closely. This Christmas time, we should not so much ask the question as God does, what shall I do? But we ourselves should ask, what shall we do? I had a friend, Jerry. Jerry was one of our regulars at the food pantry when I was serving in West Unity. He lived up in Alverden, mostly because he had come out of one of the halfway houses there, He had nowhere else to go. So he rented one of the very, very, very cheap single room apartments. No, Jerry doesn't look very clean. He smells constantly of cigarette smoke. Because of his disability check, basically covers his rent and A few small goods, he relies on the food pantry, like the one in West Unity, to get his food. But Jerry played chess. In fact, Jerry has been my only regular game in eight years of ministry of late. Anytime I would go up and pick him up, to take him to the store or the food pantry or to get a phone card, we'd end up back at my office and play a game or two. One time, just before Christmas, I was up in Alverden and drove by his place of residence and noticed that his door was open, so I stopped by to check in on him. He was actually in need of a ride down to Bryan to another church to pick up a food basket that was being provided for him for Christmas. 
I had some time, so I told him to go ahead and jump in, and we'd drive on down there. And yes, I had some money for a phone card, too. So we rode along, we talked a little bit about chess, his stepson, his ex-wife, other minor concerns. What was interesting is what happened when we got to the church. Now, like many church professionals, when I enter another church, I like to look around, see if I can find a bulletin, a newsletter, some of their ministry boards. All the best ideas come from someone else who's already made them work. I'd been working in the office, so I wasn't necessarily dressed up. I was in office casual attire, if you will. And Jerry, well, Jerry was Jerry. Another family was leaving with their boxes as we arrived, and there were only two sets of boxes left in the hallway. The woman in charge came up to us as we entered. Can I help you? I wandered off. Jerry said his name and that he was there to pick up his food basket, and he walked over where there were two boxes clearly marked with his lame. Where are those other two boxes that were right there? The woman commanded. Don't touch those. Where are those other two boxes? Were they red? Jerry asked. Another woman came in and explained that the family had just left. Everything was fine. Fine, fine. You'll have to fill out these forms. I was down at the other end of the narthex at that point, looking at the pictures of their various pastors and their elder board. Can I help you? She said in a shrill voice. I half turned around and Jerry explained that no, he was, I was with him. And Well, you've got to fill out these forms. I think you get the point. I was a little angry, disappointed, ashamed. Certainly pray that no one coming into our congregation for assistance would ever be treated in such a manner. What shall we do? believe that we have to reach out for our relationship with God in the same desire that God has shown in reaching out to us. I believe that we have to see the face of Christ on every person we meet and treat them as our brothers and sisters, regardless of their situation, regardless of what they look like, what they smell like, what they sound like, how they speak, what culture they come from, how they dress what they believe. I believe that we have to act like the people redeemed by salvation. We have to offer the same sense of grace and love that we have found for the sake of Christ's glory. I think in a world that seems to be looking into its future with a great deal of question marks, we need to be the exclamation point. Love, mercy, acceptance, grace. In this Christmas season, may that be the present you find wrapped under your tree in some way, shape, or form, the opportunity to live that back out into the world. Amen.